Frankie Boyle's not just a comedian with a massive following. He's also got a lot of very interesting things to say about, you know, how the how Britain is at the moment, how the world is, about foreign policy, about how our press works. And a, a lot of the time, a lot more perceptive than people whose job it is to actually comment on that full time. Hiya. Uh, so I want to talk to him about what's going on in Britain, what's going on in the world, you know, the role of comedy in politics and all the rest. And, you know, does he have optimism? What worries me about asking you about Theresa May is there's a significant chance by the time this video goes out she'll have gone she'll have gone I mean how is she still there there's no one else to replace her with because like what are you can do like the, so they have a, Gove? well they have a bunch of people don't they? Well, Gove sort of looks like a fucking balloon animal or something doesn't he has that kind of eerie air to him but they have people who are just there to go and kind of run across a minefield right so they have like Michael Fallon or someone that they send you know when they need someone to go on Mars and get destroyed he's just like one of those chimps they send into space they just pull out Michael Fallon right so they can get a placeholder leader like that but they've assessed it's not going to do them any good but also they just don't have any talent to replace it with who have they got like Boris they've got you know, they've got some of the worst people in the world. The whole thing that they are is a group of people pretending to represent the interests of a constituency that they don't represent. They represent the interests of these other people. They represent the interests of capital. And they're the class enemy, really, of the people that they say they represent. The sort of people that are going to go into that are broken sociopaths. You know, there's a whole public school system that's designed to break these people's psyches to a point where they can spend their life lying to this group of people on behalf of this other group of people, you know? And that doesn't breed talented people who can connect with the public. Theresa May called the election not that long ago, it was just a few weeks ago, uh, to crush the opposition of Britain. How do you explain, that? I mean, that, there's no election in modern history in Britain that you can just see such a dramatic turnaround in fortunes. All the data is not in yet statistically about what the reasons for it were, but I think an important thing to remember is that these are people who are used to dealing with crisis. Mm. So these are you know, disaster capitalists. The Conservative Party is packed with people who are used to profiting from a crisis. So Theresa May at the moment is tied onto the bumper of their, their war bus, <laughs> right? And she's soaking up bullets or whatever. And she serves that function for them at the moment. But just by getting rid of Theresa May isn't going to change anything. You need structural change. You need some, some uh, radical uh, change that's going to uh, disrupt. So soon we might have the Democratic Unionist Party propping up the government. Yeah. They're lovely, they are. Yeah, but I think it just says a lot about British culture as well, that people didn't really know who the DUP were. And you're like, well, that's part of Britain. You've, you've, it's, it's, you've enforced it to be part of Britain. You've insisted that this is part of Britain and you can't even be bothered to know what it is. There's even still people, like, I see people on the left talking about Sinn Féin taking up their seat. She's like, do you not know why they're not... Do you not know what they've got against Britain? <laughs> like, the, kind of goes to their entire reason of existing. But it's, I mean, it says a lot about us that we, we don't, you know... We, we are, like everybody is, very Westminster focused, very metropolitan, you know, biased. For the first time in my lifetime, the Tories are scared of two groups of people, the left and young people. I mean, that is astonishing, isn't it? Yeah, sure, but I mean, I think again, I'm saying the real note of caution, which is that they've prepared for this. This is what they imagined was going to happen. So the reason there's a housing benefit cap is to get young people and to get minorities out of the city centre because their ideal for London is it'd be more like Paris mm -hmm. and you'd have rings of poor people on the outside who come into clean hotels and things like mm -hmm. that and it's also it's easily fortifiable mm -hmm. so in the event of a riot remember the last riots in Paris they just mm -hmm. cordoned off a few streets mm -hmm. and they went yeah burn your own area down we don't care you just left it to burn and if you even look at the thing that's happened with Grenfell Tower I mean you know we got a corporate manslaughter law brought in in 2007 right but it's very difficult to convict an individual of corporate manslaughter. Almost every corporate manslaughter charge is just a fine that's made to a company. I mean, they've, they've deliberately structured that law in a way that when things like this happen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, they aren't accountable. The Grenfell Tower atrocity, just a criminal disaster. For years, residents there said that this is a death trap, that there will be a fire which will be catastrophic and kill people. Yeah. So what does mm -hmm. it say about this country? If they have a council that doesn't respond to people saying this is a fire risk, if they send legal letters threatening people who've said it's a fire risk, if they deliberately choose materials when they could have chosen other materials that weren't flammable, if, they if we have regulations that aren't uh, up to the same standards as even America, right, but or Germany or the rest of Europe, to what extent is that an accident? 
I mean, to me, that seems like a contingency. Because there were so many conscious decisions taken, exactly. which all pointed in one direction, and that, exactly. was, that was this terrible disaster. And some people decided that that risk was affordable in the pursuit of profit. Obviously, it's deeply immoral, whatever happens, but that takes it to an absolute different level of immorality for me. Because it tells us how this country's run, doesn't it? Like, but as it, social order. But this, but this is why I think people are so angry, is that they, they can sense from this what, they've, what they already know, mm -hmm. which is that their lives aren't valued in the same way. There's a connection between a Conservative government that wants to get rid of human rights legislation mm -hmm. and uh, people being treated as less than human in that building. And people can make that connection for themselves. Just because they have a media that isn't making that connection mm -hmm. doesn't mean that people are unaware of it. Some of the residents of survivors um, of Grenfell Tower have been very, very angry indeed at the media. Wh yeah. Why do you think that is? I think th the media comes from a kind of self-contained culture that often just doesn't understand mm -hmm. people in Britain. And it particularly doesn't understand, and it even say it doesn't care to understand, mm -hmm. people who have different ethnic backgrounds, mm -hmm. people who have refugee or migrant backgrounds. Um, and it doesn't particularly care about people having a uh, different class. It doesn't care about understanding them either. So obviously you've now reached a stage where, you know, the media go to something like that and people are like, well, fuck off. Well, of course they're saying that. Social media for a long time, people were quite sceptical about his role, but in the election you saw, you know, memes about, you know, I don't know, grime for Corbyn, Facebook videos which went viral, that momentum did. Like, is it starting to fall to pieces, that media kind of hegemony in terms of what, d d controlling the means of information in Britain? No, but I think it's encouraging. I think there's encouraging signs. So even when we look at like the Grenfell Tower thing now, you're seeing more voices from down there, from like the community association, and, and rel more relevant voices, more representative voices. Like in the old days, can you imagine that would have just been like the local MP, yeah. you know, getting reported what he said the in the, the paper. Best. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's pluses and minuses with social media, but one of them is if it becomes an exchange of rhetoric you're going to lose, mm -hmm. because if it just becomes who can do the better sound bite, who can create the better meme or whatever, you're always going to lose, because the ultimate message that's ag against the, the system that we live in is that it's more sophisticated than that. I mean, that's the, that's the message I think Corbyn started to do towards the end of the election campaign, was go, well, actually, it's going to be a lot more difficult than that. It's going to be more sophisticated than that. Mm -hmm. And if social media starts to get used like that, so people start to read more long form stuff and start to, to learn more mm -hmm. uh, in depth about subjects, then it'll be good. But like, you're, you're, you're not going to get anywhere with just memes. Do you think Scotland's going to become independent still? What do you think? I think it's going to be a long haul. I mean, I think the SNP have misplayed their hand slightly in that, you know, they were agitating for a second referendum that people don't really want at the moment. A bit knackered of it all. Yeah, know. there's also political fatigue. Yeah. But there's also, I mean, the thing is, like, the SNP aren't offering anything radical to a Scottish society that has a lot of cross currents yeah. and a lot of reasons to remain in the union that I personally would think are quite irrational. So there's people I knew who were like, I'm, I'm going to vote against independence because my granddad was in the British Army. That's not really a progressive idea of Scotland. It's not a radical enough offer that, you, you know, it's going to sway people who've got, you know, significant kind of social reasons for wanting to be in the union. Do you get a lot of pushback being someone who, because a lot, you get a lot of, I don't know, high profile comedians and musicians or wh whoever who do care about certain issues, but they don't talk about it because they think it'll just mess up their career. Do you I ever don't think I can mess up my career any further. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt like that though. Do you think others get scared of it though? Right, I yeah, concept. totally. And I can see why as well. When you just even see the amount of things that are taken out of context, mm -hmm. never mind the things that, you know, are actually kind of like taken in context. I mean, some of it's just absolutely fucking bonkers. I had a thing one time where it was like, the Scottish Daily Express was trying to prosecute me for obscenity. <laughs> right? oh, yeah, and, yeah. and they were going to, they flew some guy over from Northern Ireland, some mad kind of unionist, to go to my local police station and file a complaint so I could be, I had been the first thing since uh, Lady Charlie's lover, I think. <laughs> and uh, the police didn't bite, but the, the Express publisher at the time was the guy who uh, made uh, Anal Spunk Fest, that porn line. <laughs> oh, yes. And you know, I had made a joke the Daily about Express going, <laughs> the guardians of moral culture in modern Britain. Yeah, and then after Charlie Hebdo, they're like, oh, you know, freedom of speech and all that. And you're like, I, would, I literally did a joke with the Queen. You tried to get me jailed. Yes. Everyone's capable of taking severe offence. But there's that culture, isn't there, where it's only 
you know, the Express, which is the, accuses the left of being humorless, offence mongers, always throw outrage. The Express, all it does is... It's easier to write outrage. outrage. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, if you go, oh, pe a guy made a joke and people were a bit baffled and mildly disappointed by it. <laughs> it's very difficult to get a front page out of that. <laughs> so you just go, oh, people are outraged. And now they've got Twitter, which is like, if you want to find, if you want to prove people thought anything, <laughs> like just type into Twitter, because people th will think this interview is both great and terrible. And you can just, you know, it's literally just a backup for whatever you want to say. Britain is much more like a pi pioneer town like just under the surface, so we've got this, we've got this air of civility, but there's still jokes you could do that would land you in significant like danger. The left's often accused of just being morally righteous and outraged about everything, and sometimes you can think, I can see why that's said. But if you make certain jokes, particularly about I don't know the monarchy or something, that's when you get. I see, mean, when the Queen dies, if you made a joke about the Queen dying, you'd be you might get lynched. <laughs> you'd be lynched. But I think there's also, I think I'm really interested in that area, not just because I do it, yeah. but like I think there's a problem in our society where because we can't have a real morality, so we live in a, a country that profits from selling arms, launders money, all the rest of it, right? And that's where our taxes go. Yeah. Like some of our taxes are going to bomb Syria this week. We can't live real moral lives, so we have these. The, the a morality we create through our taste. And we go, oh, I think that's too much. That's, that, oh, they, they shouldn't have allowed this play to be shown, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we create this kind of faux morality. Do you know, you see people criticizing people for stuff. Yeah, she did a video. So I think about Lily Allen, you know, she was in this Grenfell Tower thing. And people, she did a video like six years ago that was demeaning to, <laughs> like, and you're like, Right. Okay, man, but that's you, you've got to understand where those ideas come from. Yeah, that's yeah. a religious idea, uh -huh. you know, the idea that she, you know, isn't pure anymore because she's done something that you mm. disagree with and that your taste defines what mm. her morality is and all this different stuff. You know, it's it's quite a complex psychological soup that's going on there in our society where we think we have the right to say what's moral and what's immoral, often based on very little information. Mm. So in the old days, there'd be an idea that maybe a religious figure, a priest or something, could tell if someone was good or bad. Mm. But they'd have to meet them. Yeah. Like, to go to the stage of, like, here's a few words said by someone, mm -hmm. like, that's the authority of a kind of Mesopotamian god yeah. king. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are immoral. They will always be immoral. Lily Allen said something six mm. years ago. She's immoral. <laughs> you know, it's like an incredible level of hubris. Is everything going to be okay? Everything's going to be fine, man. <laughs> fine. Everything's going to be fine. I'm hugely optimistic, but with huge caveats. Yeah, so the, like, the caveats you are know, important. If you think Theresa May going is going to change stuff, it's not going to change stuff. They, they've planned for that. Mm. If you think um, you know, uh, the government collapsing and them having another election um, is going to change things, it's not going to change things unless you do something that's going to create some structural change. So there's huge cause to be optimism, certainly loads more than like six weeks ago. But you know, at the same time, you've got to remember the, the opposition are people who train for crisis and who train for exactly this sort of situation. Fascinating stuff from Frankie there. Uh, and again, embarrassing for much of the professional political commentary that a lot more interesting and incisive and challenging than a lot of what most of them have to offer. No offence. Uh, I include myself. Um, we've got loads of other interviews to come uh, at this time of tumult uh, in which we live, but also uh, also tragedy. But we want to talk to a big range of people. We've got lots of interviews we've already done, so do uh, click above. Uh, leave your comments, subscribe. I'll see you next time.